This morning I'll be reading Psalm 103, verses 1 through 12. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your inequity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our inequities. For as the heaven love towards those who fear him, as far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. This is the word of the Lord. As you probably know, during this month of August, we are looking at readings from the letter to the Hebrews. <clears throat> and this particular text is kind of complicated. Uh, perhaps you will listen with ease and know every single reference that it makes to the Old Testament and to other uh, items of faith, but challenge. So please do not lose heart the complicated nature of it, but uh, basically it is a call to revere the God of love and justice and mercy and judgment. So here are these words from the letter to the Hebrews chapter 12 verses 18 through 29. You have not come to something that can be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them for they could not endure the order that was given if even an animal touches the mountain it shall be stoned to death indeed so terrifying was the sight that moses said i tremble with fear but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. The word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. So now that time with all ages that didn't make it into the bulletin. Uh, I'm going to invite us all. We don't need a microphone. Uh, this passage in part talks again about what cannot be seen. In this case, it's the sanctuary, the temple, uh, and what can and cannot be seen. And so I thought I'd invite each of you or by a show of hands or popcorn style, what do you see in this sanctuary, whether you're on Zoom? Well, it might be difficult for you to unmute yourself on Zoom, but those of you here in the sanctuary, what do you see with your physical eyes in this sanctuary? Can someone name something that they see? The cross, yes, what else? Stained glass, pipe organ, uh, me, <laughs> what else? Someone over here was going to say something. The flowers, gorgeous flowers. The pews where people sit. What about this thing right here? Does anyone notice this anymore? We don't have it prominently displayed. But that's the baptismal font. And what is this here? The communion table. I'm so glad you didn't say the altar. It's the communion table. We have some lights because it is dark today. And if we were to worship in the evening, we need those lights so that we can see hymnals or our bulletin or I can see what I'm reading. What else? Anything else? Dick Tinsler at the keyboard. Yes, yeah, so we not only have the organ pipes, we have the keyboard and the piano, and we have people who play the keyboard and the piano. The choir loft. The choir loft. And Hmm? Church the church family. Yes, you see part of the church family right here sitting by you. And we see some of our church family on the screen. Hey, uh, Bob, would you zoom in on me for a sec with the camera? Uh, anyway, and we also see a Bible in the Purex and the hymnal. There's all kinds of things that we physically see with our eyes when we're in this space. And in some ways, when we're worshiping on Zoom, you see some of that as well. So what are some of the things that you don't necessarily see with your physical eyes here in this space and yet are part of our worship together? And I think Dana mentioned the church family because it's probably not just the people sitting in this pew, in these pews that we're kind of, we might see folks here with our physical eyes and see folks who are uh, on Zoom on, this, on the wall here, but we also might in our mind's eye see people who are not here physically. Perhaps they've even joined the church triumphant, as we say. Maybe they've passed on to the next life, but in a way, we see them in our mind's eye. They're not physically here, but they are part of our worship here this morning. Anything else that you, is part of what you're seeing, but not with your eyes when you worship? The silence, it kind of seeps into you. You can't see silence, but it, it's, it's there. The love and compress to you, the overall feeling. Hopefully that feeling is also true for people who visit and that find a welcome here. Anything else that's not seen with eyes? Yes, yes. Larry. You sense in ways, to greater or lesser extent, depending upon a lot of things, that we might feel God's presence when we're worshiping, whether it's at home or here in the sanctuary when we're worshiping. Hopefully we are blessed with a little bit of that experience of God's presence that maybe we don't always feel in our day-to-day -day activities. Anything else? There's not really, I'm not searching for uh, preset answers to this question. Anything else that you kind of experience but can't see with your eyes? The Holy Spirit, that's another way of naming that, that presence of God. Yes, yeah. 
And I would just add that in addition to silence, which we can't see, is music. Uh, is that um, we don't see it with our eyes, but boy, is it, is it real and it shapes our experience. So there are many things that we see without seeing. And that's part of what Hebrews, you may remember, uh, faith is that which is uh, not seen, but oh, I should have memorized that verse, but you hopefully know the verse I'm talking about. <laughs> Evidence of things hoped for. Yes, thank you very much. So um, the love that God has for each of us in times of pain, in times of loss, in times of joy and celebration, all of that is part of our worship. So when we worship, we remember not only the people we can see with our physical eyes, we also remember that great communion of saints that we talked about last Sunday, the, uh, the great cloud of witnesses who are in some ways worshiping with us. And those are not just South Plains worshipers. Those are the saints of all time. So we dip into that in some mysterious way that we can't quantify, we can't name it with our eyes or see it with our physical eyes, but we are experiencing something bigger than ourselves when we worship with other people, whether that's online or in a physical space. Uh, and that is part of what we're touching on today is this bigness of God and God's love. So let us pray. Loving God, help us to see with not only our eyes, but with our hearts, all the ways in which we are knit together as a community of faith here and bonded with brothers and sisters around the planet and over the centuries. We give thanks for this great cloud of witnesses, for your Holy Spirit, for this beautiful sanctuary, for technology that helps us worship uh, across the miles. For all these things, we give thanks. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't think anyone could credibly accuse me of being a fire and brimstone preacher. I know I've only been here about 13 months, but uh, I think hopefully you've gotten the swing of that, that I am not a fire and brimstone preacher. The whole sinners in the hands of an angry God has never been a theme in my preaching or my ministry, other than to perhaps refute it as central to the gospel the way I am right now. Perhaps some of you grew up or at least have been exposed to preachers who have that theological stance, uh, a one that hopes to scare people into wanting to be saved from their sinfulness in this life and especially from the threat of eternal damnation by an angry God in the next. Now, of course, there are plenty of biblical passages that support this perspective. I'm not, I'm not saying that it isn't in the Bible. But for me and for many, many others, the good news of Jesus Christ is about God's love that redeems and renews. So I think I could probably be credibly accused of domesticating God sometimes, of focusing so much on God's steadfast love, the kind of love that Lynn read from Psalm 103, that kind of love being emphasized that I might be in danger of putting God in a tiny little box where I think I have God figured out that I understand God. And that's a foolish notion to say the least. Where, for instance, is the mystery of the creator of the universe? Where is the transcendence of a God whose power is beyond my imagining? Do I sacrifice the power of God in honor of the closeness of God. Writer Annie Dillard wrote a beautiful and 
quite dense. I did make my way through it years and years ago. Uh, a narrative, nonfiction narrative book called Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Has anyone ever read that? Yes, it's it's worth reading, but it's uh, it's fecund is a word I learned when I read that book. Anyway, she wrote that book in 1974, and she describes in amazing and sometimes excruciatingly detailed uh, her experiences of God in nature in one particular place, Tinker Creek, which happens to be not so far away from where we are uh, in Oak. So eight years after writing Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, she's a writer, she's written a lot of things, but she wrote a book that I have not yet read, but uh, a quote from it went, as we say now, viral. And the book is Teaching a Stone to Talk, Expeditions and Encounters. And this quote really, especially in the internet age, is referenced, and I think, but it's Annie Dillard, and uh, this quote is as follows, and she's talking about to the average churchgoer like you and me uh, about this transcendent God that we worship. And she writes, does anyone have the foggiest idea of the power we so blithely invoke? It is madness to wear ladies straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to the pews." End quote. No doubt, I may have made reference to this, but no doubt uh, most of you have seen by now the images that have come from NASA um, starting um, about five or six weeks ago. They were taken by the James Webb Space telescope, the one they shot out even further away than Hubble, so it can take clearer and clearer and more detailed images. So I, I hope you would agree that these images are nothing short of breathtaking. The one that struck me deeply as I reflected on our Hebrews passage and Psalm 103 is one that's called the first deep field. Now I watch some of the NASA uh, documentaries. I don't know about these things, but a deep field picture is one where they set the telescope for a longer period of time on one little piece of sky. They, I think they described it as if they held up a straw to the sky and they pointed this powerful telescope out in space to that one little space in sky for a long time so that it could absorb more and more light going further and further, not only in distance, but back in time, because, of course, it takes years for light to come to us and to the telescope. So these images, I, I wax poetic because I'm pretty fascinated by it all. Uh, this light has traveled 4 billion, maybe 13 billion years, light years. So it's that far away in time and in distance. So in this one of those images that they uh, sent out in July. It shows galaxy, 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 the occasional star that's closer up. And they, they estimate that it's really showing thousands of galaxies in this one pinpoint, not a pinpoint, but a straw, looking through a straw in the night sky and it boggles the mind the vastness that thousands of galaxies like our own milky way are out there and then of course multiply that by however many straws you would see it it is mind-blowing to use that terminology that we live in a universe that is so incredibly vast and it's hard enough for me anyway to think about beyond our solar system or beyond the Milky Way, because that's all we really see uh, with our naked eye. We can maybe in the dark night sky see the milk, milk part of the sky, but we don't see these vast universes and, well, galaxies upon galaxies. So it's natural for us as human beings, as beings, to focus on our lives, to what's happening in our own lives, 
to what's happening in this congregation, in our hometown, maybe our nation, and maybe even for our planet Earth. All that's happening, it's disheartening. There's also glimmers of hope. All of that is natural. So to think about this vastness of space beyond our planet can be very humbling. We may not be the center of the universe. We are part of a galaxy that's part of perhaps millions of galaxies. So I enjoyed hearing so many of the astronomers, uh, some of whom had worked a decade or 15 years or their whole careers just on the James Webb Space Telescope. So on this project, and they were talking with awe and reverence about the universe that these images show. They were, they were childlike in some ways and their tone was bordering on religious. It was, it was pretty remarkable. So as I was thinking about this kind of reverence, I thought about clergy titles, the Reverend Doctor. Now I'm old school. Uh, I like that article, the, in front of Reverend, and it gets dropped sometimes, but I'm old school because Reverend is an adjective. This is a little lesson. Um, but until I did some etymology very recently, I always thought it describes someone in a clergy role as someone who reveres God. In other words, the reverend, the one who reveres. And I thought, oh, that fits nicely with what we're talking about, reverence for God. Well, I got it all wrong, and I'm still mentioning it because I thought it was uh, interesting that it really, uh, the term is like the honorable judge so-and-so. It's referring to someone that should be revered. So I now have to rethink about the way I think about that. I always celebrated, oh, it means I revere God, uh, the way we're all called to do, not just clergy, but we're all called to do. So um, a minister is called the Reverend Ms. Jane Jones or the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. So I'd hope to reference that reverence for God, and uh, but there I've shared that piece of information with you anyway. <laughs> So turning to this complicated passage from Hebrews, the, uh, the last two Sundays we've, we've heard uh, as the letter moves forward from the last few chapters about by faith, Abraham did this by faith, by faith, by faith, and then last Sunday, that great cloud of witnesses by faith, by faith, by faith. It's all encouraging. And our reading today may sound like it's not encouraging, but it is hoping to encourage those believers who were pretty um, handling difficult times in the letter to the Hebrews and encouraging them to realize that um, not only are they to run the race with perseverance, the way we talked about last Sunday, but um, that we pass the baton to the next generation. In today's reading, the letter to the Hebrews brings home the encouragement to follow through on discipleship, a dose of fear of God's power to hold unshakable the eternal life we trust is already real in some mysterious way through God's grace in Jesus Christ. So it's encouraging, but it's a little dose of fear. <clears throat> so this month, uh, this sermon series is called A Compass, Not a Map. It's about how these words from Hebrews might inform us in the 21st century about we live in turbulent times. I think that's clear pre-pandemic and then especially the pandemic has shaken things even more. So the letter to the Hebrews was addressing hardship and turbulence of its own kind. And so we feel aspects of this in the 21st century. There are so many unknowns in church life, in cultural life. We live in tents for now, as we talked about that two weeks ago, and we run a relay race where we may not see the destination. We pass the baton to the generation that follows us. So to speak about a dose of fear may seem counter to this theme, which is really about trusting the compass, the compass of God and the Holy Spirit. But like the people who first heard the letter to the Hebrews, a little dose of fear 
may inspire rather than paralyze. The last thing I want is to paralyze anybody. The theme from the wonderful Family Bible School this summer in July had five words. Pat held up her hand, so I will do too. Uh, fear not, trust in God. And it was consoling to remember the stories in the Bible of all these different people through the puppet shows who endured difficult situations, they trusted God, and they made it through. The dose of fear that I am talking about is not the fear for our particular situation as a congregation, which again, we are doing great, uh, but just the general fear of all the change that's going around us. That's not the kind of fear I'm talking about. God has that covered, I truly believe. And it is not a fear of God, fire and brimstone fear of an angry God. As Psalm 103 verse four assures us, God crowns you. So the dose of fear of God here is about humility and reverence. For the God who is the creator of the universe, the vast universe, the creator of thousands and thousands of galaxies, the God who is beyond our grasp and yet, and yet, who also came to earth, to the world, in Jesus Christ. Frederick Borsch is a New Testament professor, a former Episcopal bishop, and he wrote about this complicated passage from Hebrews, and I thought, a couple of the threads he mentioned were worth sharing. He talks about it as three scenes in a very dramatic play. And the first scene refers to Moses. You may remember that verse about the mountain and the animal that would die if it set foot on the holy mountain. Uh, it doesn't name Mount Sinai specifically, but that's what it's about, about the terror that struck the people uh, of this forbidding and terrible, in that sense of the word, place, holy place. And so the second scene the writer of Hebrews describes is Mount Zion. It's contrasted. It's the heavenly city of Jerusalem that the believers of Hebrews can see without seeing. In other words, going back to that idea that we don't quite see with our eyes there are angels, there are spirits of the saints, those who have been perfected and righteous. And of course, there is Jesus, the mediator. So, and Borsch writes about one more scene in this short Hebrews passage. He says, oh, but there is now yet a third scene in our drama. Do not imagine that the poetry of heaven means that one can forget that this is still the same God. And this is where I think it's important to remember. This is still the same God, the God of both righteousness and love. Probably many of us, he writes, would like to emphasize God's mercy nearly to the exclusion of judgment. And yes, I confess to doing that sometimes. That would not be the God of scripture, nor when we stop to think would we be pleased if in the end we discovered that God did not really care about unrighteousness, injustice, cruelty, and evil. That God did not care whether we tried to build at least some aspects of the kingdom here on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. And this is the final point he makes. Ultimately, God's justice and judgment must be included in God's love. Ultimately, God's justice and judgment must be included in God's love. So as we navigate this uncertain cultural and religious landscape, we do not need to fear for our situation, though the mountains shake. We do not need to fear being sinners in the hands of an angry God. 
a little dose of fear and reverence for the power of the God of love and justice, of mercy and judgment, this little dose of fear is a blessing. It reminds us that God's love is bigger than we can imagine. God's power is bigger than we can imagine. God's steadfast love endures forever. And in God's power, there is a place where the ground cannot be shaken. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. Amen. <laughs>